Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 120, we're going to take a look at the 6A S7G, the 6080, and the Soviet equivalent to these tubes, the 6N13S. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So we recently got in a number of these beautiful Svetlana tubes. Let's take a look at the logo up close. Now in Cyrillic, there's the 6H13C. But even our wholesalers in Eastern Europe will use the Western equivalent. So the 6 stays the same. But the H becomes an N, one three, and the C becomes an S. A little confusing, but always use your Western numbers, even with Soviet tubes. And look at that beautiful winged C logo of the Svetlana tube. I love everything about Svetlana. They made really great tubes, you know, construction-wise, sonically. The logos are fab fabulous even. so, And we're going to look at these in a little bit more detail in a minute. Charles will take you through them. Now, the, the Svetlana tube is a direct equivalent of the 6AS7G. And we realize that we've never done a tube lab on this type. And that's a real shame because these are really interesting tubes. The 6AS7G or in its later incarnation, the 6080, was originally used as a series passing or voltage regulator tube in power supplies. So what does that mean? Well, the tube acted as a buffer between a circuit and its power supply, allowing the current drawn to vary while holding the voltage supplied at a mostly constant level. So these were used to build the tube version of a regulated power supply. They were able to do this because they can provide a huge amount of current for a single tube, up to 125 milliamps per section. And this is, let me get it over here, this is a, this is a dual triode. So 125 milliamps times two, that's 250 milliamps. Wowee! <laughs> Now, Charles is really big on these tubes, and he's going to walk you through the various types, and I think you're going to start with the data sheet, eh? Yep, let's pull out a data sheet here. So we have this great vintage Tung Sol data sheet for the 6AS7G. And how do we know it's vintage? Well, we look at the date at the bottom of the sheet, which I think is 1962. That might be a one. It's a little bit blurry, but either way, this is the original Tung Sol. And we have a few interesting points highlighted here for it. First of all, 6.3 volts on the heater, which is great. That's a, a great standard to follow, but 2.5 amps of current draw, which is huge. But we see this with high current tubes and it's a requirement for them. The other thing that's really nice is that we have an octal base on it. Being a dual triode, it can make use of all of the eight pins and the basis and pinout is standardized across all these different versions that we're talking about here. So they're all compatible without modifying a socket or an amplifier. Let's take a look at the amplification factor and it's a whopping 2.0. Which is next to nothing. Next to nothing. So obviously this is not a voltage amplifying tube. It will double it if you have it biased correctly for it. But this tube is meant to push current and that's what it was meant for and that's what it does. On the next page, we've got our maximum plate voltage. So on top of pushing a lot of current, it does it at a very low plate voltage. A lot of the time you'll see high power tubes operating really high voltage, sometimes in the kilovolt range. But we have 275 volts max on the plate and 125 milliamps max on the plate. This is the rating for each section. And that results in us getting a plate resistance of around 280 ohms. We've just added this onto here. Uh, other data sheets have it, and this is our reference sheet for the tube. So the 280 ohms 
makes it a really interesting tube for something called an output transformerless amplifier, shorted, a short form to OTL. And in amplifiers like that, you don't have an output transformer. Instead, you have the tube directly coupled to your speaker or headphone. And you have to have a very low plate resistance for that to work, and this is incredibly low. So let's take a look at some other examples of these tubes here. So we've already taken a look at the 6N13S, or the 6H13C, and this is an excellent example of it. And these tubes look really, really similar to the very early version Western produced 6AS7s. So this one was made by Chatham Electronics. They might be a rebrander, I'm not actually sure on that, but this is a Jan 6AS7G, and you can see construction-wise they're almost identical to each other. And why is that? Well, we talked about this before, and Soviet production leading into World War II was actually set up by RCA and Western powers because they wanted to make sure they could supply their own tubes in the event of a conflict. So, in essence, almost all Soviet production of standard Western-type tubes is built on RCA technology and engineering originally. It changed later on, and they made their own types, but that's why there are a lot of Western or a lot of Soviet equivalents to Western tubes. What else do we have here? Well, we've got this nice Westinghouse box, and we have another 6AS7 inside here, but this one is a little bit different. This is the 6AS7GA. Here's the label right here. So that anytime you have an extra character on the end, it means it's a revision on the original. So the specs are, are likely slightly different or it was made to be a little more robust in some way. In this case, we have a straight bottle, so that's an obvious change right there. But otherwise, the plates look the same. It's a little bit shorter, so it might have been designed to fit into more compact equipment. And even though this label says Westinghouse on it, and so does the box, we can, I'll see if I can get that on camera, we've got some dots right under the label here. And that is a sure sign that this was actually a GE manufactured tube that was just rebranded for Westinghouse. So as an example of a straight bottle, what happened after the 6AS7GA? Well, we started going into 6080s. And the 6080 is essentially the same tube. It has slightly different specifications, but it's compatible in every way that matters. And here is an absolutely beautiful Mullard example. And just the fact that we have a Mullard tube made in a Mullard plant, you can see the capital R, which was, what was the plant there again? Uh, capital R is Mitcham. Mitcham. U UK. Mitcham, UK. So this is a... UK made Muller tube with an American designator on it, the 6080, and that shows you how common and ubiquitous these tubes were. They were used everywhere. And that's a beautiful Muller example, and it still has that same plate structure inside there. So the 6080s came after the 6AS7s, and these have several different revisions on them as well. Notably the WA and the WB versions, which were more robust um, meant for military purpose. They were essentially stronger versions of the original two, but otherwise the same specs. But there was a very interesting version of them made, and this is quite possibly one of the rarest versions of the 6080s ever made. It's a Bendix 6080 WB. And as you can see, the plate structure and the build of the tube is entirely different across the board here. We have these huge graphite plates. They're very chunky. And we have these support rods for them and ceramic spacers and these metal spacers holding everything together here. So this is a really interesting tube. It was, we had to pick it out and show it off. And um, there's some good news and some bad news about this. You want to share it? Well, the good news is we found one. <laughs> the, the bad news is when we researched how much they sell for, it looks like it's one of those rare tubes that some sellers 
are frankly they're abusing the market because they're asking what a thousand dollars a tube something like that for a used tube version of this and that's just ridiculous so what we usually do is we find the cheapest market price for the same or very similar tube and we try to either match or beat it uh, so it's still a very expensive tube in the store but it's also one of the lowest priced versions of this tube on the market so mm -hmm. and incredibly rare too this is the first time that we've seen one and yeah we didn't even know they existed nope no, nope. so, and um, so and this we have a lot of 6AS7s. Yeah, and considering we only have one of them, this would probably be a good example to use in an OTL headphone amp that uses two individual sections, one for each channel. So that's a in very interesting tube, and it's in the store. So there's a good look at a variety of the different 6AS7s and 6080s and 6N. 13 S's. Well, well we done. Have. Thanks a lot for that, Charles. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to clear the deck here, and why don't you let us know what's happening over at Melotone Kits? Oh man, I knew you were going to ask me that question. I just knew it. Well, the um, I, I've put now two months into the into the prototype phono preamp, and I'm getting there. But it's amazing the. Uh, we're hitting the limit of some high quality test equipment and the reason for that is that the signal in for testing purposes needs to be fairly close to what you normally would get off of a phono cartridge and a moving magnet produces roughly 5 millivolts RMS which is not a lot of voltage and our high quality signal generator makes a fair amount of noise down there. And that makes it really tough to test the actual circuit. But anyways, I'm making progress. Charles has been giving me a, a big hand on the technical side. And Charles, you got some news. You're almost done the, um, the build series for the GU50 monoblocks. We're, we're right at the end of it now. And we're excited because we're just about to do the first power on tests and voltage checks for it. And it won't be long until all of our test builders are listening to their amps. And you've already chosen, I think, your first song that you're going to bring your amp alive with. I have. So are you, are you going to share it with us? Oh, it's on... Um, it's kind of blue. It's kind of blue, and it's the second track of the album, which is now slipping from my mind. <laughs> is it Jake's Blues? No. Uh, I think it is, actually. It could be. Yeah. Anyways, uh, that's one of those albums where you don't listen to one track over and over again. You put the you put Kind of Blue on, and you listen to Miles' horn. Oh, it's just great to relax to. And, and you just chill out for however long both sides run. Anyways, well, we've got... One really nice tube came in. Let me go grab them and I'll show you. Now, it's not that often we find new old stock, new in the box, new in the sleeve tubes in any quantity. But a new audiophile friend of mine found these locally and he... he tried them out. Now, this is a Jan 12 AT7 WC, so that's and these are all Sylvanias. These are some of the last uh, 12AT7s made by Sylvania before the plant closed. This is, these were, we'll look at the date code, but these were probably made a year just before Phillips bought Sylvania. And like last week's uh, Jan 12AT7, they're testing way over spec. So, um, so he tried these out in, uh, in the driver slot for his monoblocks and he really liked them in that spot and that that monoblock takes a 12AX7. So and we'll talk a little bit more about the testing number and what I think's going on. And then he tried them in the 12AX7 slot of his phono preamp and he really liked them there. So I'm, I was convinced. So I went in and scurried down and picked up as many of these as I could find. Let's just take a look at the box in the tube. So here we've got GTE products. So maybe GTE actually handled the prime contract. And we've got a date code of 681, date packed 681. So all of that matches up. Let's take a look at the tube. It's going to come. <laughs> it's really in there. Yeah, it'll come out though. We know we have ways of making it come out. <laughs> so here it comes. Have a look at that. It's just gorgeous. I love the later printing on the Sylvania tubes. They were solid 
uh, as compared to the earlier stuff, which would flake right off. So whenever you see a high letter, like a WC, after the tube number, that lets you know that that's a very late variation. Or revision of the tube type. And most of the time, the higher the letter, the higher the spec. Not always, but most of the time. And here's your date code. Let's see if I get it on camera. 8126, so that's 1981 and the 26th week, right? So that's about the middle of the year, and we saw June. So that makes perfectly good sense. Now, whenever I test the tube, I want to see how it tests relative to normal new old stock, and it just, it actually pegged the meter. So I, I derated the sensitivity. I turned the meter down on my tester. I have to put an H on here to let me know that I'm using a much lower testing sensitivity and I'm still testing over new old stocks. So the gain of these tubes, believe it or not, is roughly equivalent or even exceeding a 12AX7, which explains why uh, my audiophile friend was able to sub them in a 12AX7 circuit. They're a little different than the JAN tubes I showed you last week. Uh, the plates are similar, but there's two ribs on these, and I think that's the main difference. But the testing numbers are really quite similar. They're testing just about as high, and we didn't have time to get a soundtrack into uh, the video, but I expect that these will sound very similar to the ones from last week that were made only a couple of years later and are very similar. And the other thing that's really quite interesting is that this is not really a normal 12AT7 plate. That's mostly used as a 12AX7. 12AT7 plates tended to have just one wing, not all of them. And But what is going on with manufacturers or was going on is that often they would build similar spec tubes on the same framework. So this is the framework that's pretty standard for a 12AX7. The 12AT7 is normally going to be about 70% of the gain, not in this case. Um, so they use the same framework as the 12AX7. Now, one other possibility is that the order from the Pentagon, these are U.S. military, right? JAN stands for Joint Army Navy, U.S. Joint Army Navy, is that the spec that they asked for was just really high. They wanted them to have very high gain. Um, so who knows? A lot of that information is lost. A lot of the people who built these tubes are now gone. But every once in a while, we get really lucky, and we get a whole bunch of really nice tubes in, and we get to listen to them. Okay, well, if you stay to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world, and we can reach almost everybody. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us. And there's some discount codes to help you out. There's a secret code that's pretty easy to figure out, and we've been handing out a lot of money on that secret code. And there's a new secret code if you spend the big bucks. I'm not giving you any more hints. Nobody's actually guessed it or used it yet. But if you spend a lot of money, you could probably figure out what the code would be. He says he's not giving any more hints, but he says, says this every video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm in trouble now. Yeah. Oh, well. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.